Hi, everyone. I'm glad you're here because today's episode is a doozy. Today, I have three stories that nearly shattered everyone involved as they tried to rationalize what happened to them. Just wait until you hear what you're about to hear. So if you're enjoying the channel, don't be invisible. Let us know you're out there and smash that subscribe button so we can always be together. Thanks. Now let's get into the stories. I don't have a personal encounter per se, but I believe this story should be told nonetheless. And I'm curious if anybody else out there has had a similar experience or has seen anything in the wild that they can't explain. My tale starts at a history museum in the Western United States. I used to work there for quite a while. I don't want to say the name of the museum, but I will say that we were near the Rocky Mountains. My personal area of study was prehistoric. I quite liked the challenge of trying to piece things together from a time before written records. You have to be both a scientist and a historian to get things right. And even then, some things still remain a mystery despite your best efforts. After spending eight years on my education, I taught for several years and I did many field studies. I didn't expect I would end up working at a museum, but I can't complain too much. We had quite an extensive collection of artifacts from various ages of prehistory. I loved cataloging items in the archives as well as answering questions from curious minds. All types of people would come to the museum, but I admit that I was quite surprised to see two local park rangers in their uniforms waiting for me at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning. They wanted to know my thoughts on a couple of ancient tools. That's not typically abnormal. Sometimes people will find artifacts and bring them in. The rangers had brought me two fluted spear points and a scrapper. I remember them well. They were made in the Clovis style. The rangers didn't want to tell me at first where they were found, but I started to put the pieces together, and eventually they told me the story. And it was quite a story at that. There had been a few sightings of wild men in remote locations around the mountains, both in the United States and in Canada. I'm not talking about national parks or heavily populated hiking trails, but instead backpackers who head way off marked trails. People exploring deep into the wilderness often in near untouched areas. The rangers that patrolled this particular area had received a report from two hikers who claimed to have seen a wild looking man in the backcountry with no gear. The area was surrounded by miles of wilderness with no access roads nearby. The hikers recorded the GPS coordinates of where they saw the man and reported it to the ranger station. The rangers investigated this particular incident, and after a long search, they found a cave with a primitively built structure around the outside. Something similar to a hut or a lean-to with a woven roof is the way they described it. They said they found these tools in the cave along with several others, and there were signs of recent human activity. I had to check my calendar to see if this was an April Fool's joke. It would have been a great one, but the rangers were dead serious. The tools they had presented me were near-identical recreations of the Clovis style of tools found in America around 13,000 years ago. I still didn't quite believe them, though. I'm quite skeptical of an unknown population's ability to remain hidden in the wilderness for so many years without any contact with the modern world. Why haven't we had more sightings of these wild people? And if they're out there, what exactly are they? The tools certainly looked Clovis, but the Clovis people disappeared around 9,000 years ago. The rangers both theorized that they could be responsible for the Sasquatch sightings that seemed to be prevalent throughout the continent. I think there's more to it than that, but I don't have any plausible theories myself. I asked the rangers to bring me to the site, but they refused. Imagine what we could learn from these people if they actually do exist out there. There are so many things that we don't know about their culture. We could learn what language they spoke. I can't really explain what an incredible find this would be for us historians. If the story's true, these people sound like they're living just like they were roughly 13,000 years ago, when they were hunting mammoths and mastodons across the plains. I imagine they must still be hunting big game with those fluted spear points. I do understand the ranger's reservations, though. If such a thing got out, I don't imagine it would go well for the wild people. They likely have no immunity to our diseases, and I don't suppose they would welcome us with open arms should we try to find them. 
but I can't tell you how badly I wanted to see that site. I would have done anything. Both of the rangers said the sightings were in extremely remote areas, so remote that it was surprising to even find hikers there, and they hoped to leave whatever or whoever is living out there alone for the time being. Their curiosity got the best of them, so they found me. I was the verification they needed. This experience happened to me about 15 years ago now, and I still think about it quite often. I found myself taking long hiking trips in remote locations across the continent, but I haven't yet had a sighting of my own. If they are indeed out there, and this wasn't an elaborate prank, they're keeping themselves very well hidden. They're doing it very well. I wish I had been closer to everything that happened. I wish I knew more. If I had been closer, though, I might not have the privilege of sharing this story. They might have realized that I was there, and I saw it happen. They might not have even let me quit my job and stay alive. Up until a year ago, I worked for a very prominent corporation. My role was a small one, just delivering orders in a timely two-day fashion. I covered the northern half of a sprawling American city, I can't give out too many details, I'm sorry. Proper nouns are how people get caught. Most of my deliveries went out to businesses. Very rarely did I travel into the suburbs to make residential drops. My days were fairly routine. I arrived at the distribution center at 4 a.m., loaded my blue van, and headed into the city. Deliveries took all day to complete, and every day was basically the same. And then, one day, my routine changed, and that was the moment I knew that something was wrong. After loading my truck, I was stopped by one of my supervisors. He handed me an additional box, and he asked if I would take it around with me. There was no label, no address describing where the box was going to or coming from. It wasn't paid for by any type of postage or stamp. It was an unremarkable box, half the size of a basketball. The cardboard packaging was colored black, and I had never seen a box quite like it. When I asked where the package was going, my supervisor just waved me off. They assured me that it wasn't a delivery. I simply needed to carry the box with me along my route. They promised that other drivers had done so in the past. It was simply my turn, they explained. They said the box hadn't seen the northern half of the city just yet. Now the way they described that was concerning. The way they said the box hadn't seen the city. I figured they had just misspoken, but I never clarified, thinking it was just a simple mistake. In my mind, they were testing some new GPS product that would likely be installed in our vehicles in the future, and they were keeping it in the box to keep anybody from tampering with it. The bonus they told me about, if I completed this trip without damage to the package, was more than enough to seal the deal for me. So I drove around with my little black box. I kept it with me on the passenger seat. I wanted to have my eyes on it, obviously. When I stopped for lunch, I started to doubt my GPS theory, though, because after spending time with it, I could tell that the package was humming. As I was sitting there in my seat, working my way through a slice of pizza, I kept glancing over at the box, and I almost jumped out of the van when it vibrated. I nearly dropped my slice, and for a few seconds I was convinced that I had been tricked into smuggling a bomb on board my van. When it didn't explode, I figured I was overreacting because it stopped humming once I finished my meal. In my mind, I joked with myself that the box was just hungry, envious of my lunch break. Either that or else it was impatient and wanted to get back on the road. For some reason, that idea stuck with me. Was this package keeping its own schedule? I then returned back to the distribution facility at the end of the day, and a different supervisor retrieved the box from my vehicle. They thanked me for a job well done and carried the package out of sight. As I handed it to them, I asked what it was. I even pitched my GPS theory. The question earned me a glare and a long period of silence. I quickly apologized and left for the day. That reaction now had me determined, though. I was now wanting to find out what was inside that box. 
I spoke to the other drivers and I learned pretty quickly which of them had already given the box a tour of their delivery route. So that narrowed down who would be escorting the package next. I kept my eye on those drivers who would be next. I then watched as one of them received the box and drove it around without incident. The next driver, however, was not so lucky. I arrived at the facility early that afternoon. I had rushed through my deliveries and skipped lunch so that I could arrive before this next driver. I wanted to see him hand off the box. Instead, when he pulled in, I watched as he jumped out of his driver's seat, screaming. I kept my distance. I ducked into my own van and I hunched down a bit behind the windshield. I wanted to watch as best as I could, but I did not want to get caught. I watched as the frantic driver was tackled by security. I didn't even know we had security that could deal with that kind of thing. They pinned him to the ground and bound his hands. And might I say that they looked very professional while doing it. That driver was then carried away, hogtied. I guess they even knocked him unconscious somehow. And then next I watched as my supervisors rushed into his truck and brought out the box. I could see from my seat that the black cardboard had been torn open. They were all obviously scared. They were all on their cell phones and moving so hurriedly that I wasn't surprised when two of them collided. This caused the box to fall, and I could see something tumble out. It was shaped like a small pyramid. Most of it was silver, the color of steel, and the way the light hit it, I'm confident that it was metal. But what I could not understand were the veins. These thin green streaks ran across the surface of this pyramid thing. It looked like a leaf or thinly stretched skin. The streaks were pulsating too, throbbing. Watching it made my head ache. Whatever it was was scooped back into its box and the team of supervisors all scurried off to their offices. Someone was going to be upset with them, I could tell. But I could also tell that the pyramid thing was not ours. It didn't look like any piece of technology that I had ever seen, and plenty had passed through my hands. When the other driver, the one who broke the box, didn't come back to work, I knew something was very wrong. I knew my company was hiding something. I instantly decided to quit and I let things get quiet. But your channel, Lilith, has given me a unique opportunity I've taken all the measures I need to stay safe. And I think that you and your followers deserve to know about this. You can spread the word and you can warn others without endangering me. I think the big corporations out there are working for somebody else. Maybe the government, maybe something even bigger. I think that they're driving around and scanning our cities. I think they're preparing for something and I don't know what it is. I just know that if I stay silent, none of us will be ready for it. I am well aware that I'm going to sound like an absolute lunatic here, but I swear to you that this is a true story and I wouldn't be telling it if it wasn't. I've never told a lie in my life. I physically can't do it. Five years ago, when I first got out of the army and moved to Kentucky, I decided to get a dog. I had long loved chows, so at the time I figured there was no better opportunity than to get one. It's hard to find a good chow breeder, but I managed to find one all the way up in South Dakota. She was a gorgeous red chow that I named Foxy. I got a good deal on her from the breeder because she had been saved back for breeding stock, but as it turned out, she was infertile, so she was already a year and a half by the time I brought her back to Kentucky to live with me. This dog was not used to the Kentucky woods. She had lived her life on the flatlands of the prairie, so every time we'd go for a walk in the wooded trails, she was eager to take off ahead of me and search the area. Then, every night, when we would get home, I would spend about an hour in the yard with her, picking the burrs and the twigs out of her thick fur before we got into the house. But on this particular day, we had been at the trails maybe an hour before the sky took on this weird dark gray coloring. And I started noticing flashes of light behind the clouds. It looked strange, like an unusual storm was rolling in, but in a really unusual way. So I called Foxy and we headed back to my truck and headed home. Oddly though, just a quarter of a mile down the road, the sky was clear. 
I thought about heading back, thinking the storm was passing over quickly, but Foxy was already in the car, and I didn't want to confuse her by heading back again. So we just went home. I grabbed a box of grooming tools and sat out on the porch to clean her up, and that's when I noticed that the sky overhead was now looking very much the same way it had when we were at the trail. Still, I thought it was just a strange storm brewing, and I called Foxy over in the hopes that we would get her cleaned up and in the house before the rain started pouring down. Now, chows are naturally nervous dogs, by the way, so at first it didn't really stand out to me that she seemed anxious about the change of the weather. But she kept looking at the sky and taking in the distant flashing behind the clouds, and every now and then she'd let out this deep, low growl. I tried to reassure her, told her it's okay, but she didn't seem to believe me. All at once, though, I got scared too. I watched as something dark came down, lowering itself through the clouds. It never quite came out from fully behind them, but eventually it was close enough to the bottom of the clouds that I could see the shape of it hovering, just above the mist. It was large and round, and the flashing lights were attached to its ends. Foxy pulled away from me, and she ran to the edge of the yard, where she was now directly below this thing. And then she started barking up at the sky, and she was obviously protecting me, trying to chase it off. As she stood there barking, a large flash of light came out from under the object, and a beam came through the cloud, zeroing in on her. She was right in the middle of it, barking away, and the beam seemed to be almost magnetized. There was enough static within the beam that her fluffy coat was raised, sticking out in every direction. And then there was this strobe light. Dark light. Dark light light, flashing so quickly I had to squint my eyes to protect myself. It lasted only a moment, but when I opened my eyes, the skies were clear blue and sunny. There wasn't a cloud anywhere, and Foxy was gone. I ran over to my neighbor's house and knocked on the door for help. I just needed somebody else to be helping me deal with this. I also asked them if they had seen what I had seen, but they just shook their head no. My neighbor said she'd been home all day but hadn't heard or seen a thing and that she was just now in the kitchen cooking. And that's when I realized that she was making supper and I looked down at my watch. Four hours had passed. I don't know how I lost that much time. The strobing only went on for less than a minute, it felt like. And Foxy and I were just getting ready to head in for lunch when this all started. Had I really sat on the porch all that time, staring off? at nothing. I had no idea how to deal with what I was experiencing, and so I headed back home, hoping to find Foxy back there. Luckily, she was standing on the porch at the front door when I got there, but she had this strange look in her eyes, and she was just standing, still, like a statue. But even stranger yet was the fact that her fur was still standing on end like it was when I had last seen her, standing, sticking out in all directions. To be honest, it was the better part of a week before she returned to normal. I don't have any good answers for what I experienced that day. I can only hope that whatever it was stays far away from us and that we never ever have to experience it again. So I'm currently sitting in a hotel two cities away from my house. Honestly, I am terrified and I don't know if I'll ever even be able to return there. It's an older house that was built back in 1953 or so, but it's just beautiful, so maybe I will go back. I just don't know right now. I've lived there for two and a half years. I can say I've noticed some small things that should have been warnings. Obviously, I didn't care then. I do now, though. It's all starting to make a lot of sense. I've had times where I put my coffee down on my desk, and then when I go to take a sip, somehow the cup is on the coffee table. I found drawers and cabinets open, even though I obsessively close them when I'm done. I've heard squeaks, creaks, and bangs, but I always just figured it was the wind or maybe even the house itself since it's so old. Sometimes there was a slight knocking coming from the attic, but again I just thought it was the wind or something. More recently there have been cold spots, like really cold spots. I made a mental note to have an AC guy come out and take a look. One of my friends stayed the night about a month ago, and they said that it felt like someone was watching them. They also swore that someone was sitting on the bed while they slept. 
I have cameras in my house, but not in any of the three guest rooms or the bathrooms. Anyway, this past Thursday, I came home from work at about 7.30. I brought home sushi and dumplings for dinner, and I turned on my favorite internet radio rock station, and I was sitting down to eat when the air got extremely cold. It was freezing, like so cold that my glass of water frosted over. All of a sudden, my music stopped playing. I spun around to see if somebody had walked in and messed with my Bluetooth, but no one was there, just me, alone in the dining room. And then about 30 seconds later, my music blasted back on, way louder than it had been. I jumped about 10 feet in the air, it felt like, and I told myself that it had to just be the Wi-Fi connection, that it was unstable for a moment and then turned back. And then all of my food was on the other side of the table, exactly in the same positioning as I had left it. Well, mostly, I guess. I'm embarrassed to tell you this because any normal person would have left pronto. Everything was as I left it, but it was on the opposite side of the table. I guess I told myself I had just misremembered where I'd put everything. I don't know. I sat down to finally eat my food, thinking that maybe I was just overly hungry and not paying attention to what I was doing. But as soon as my butt hit the chair, I heard three extremely loud knocks from upstairs, just above the dining room. I ran up the stairs with my chopsticks still in my hand. I stopped at the top landing. Standing in the doorway of the guest bedroom was a man. He was almost see-through. He had this evil smile on his face, and his lips were thin and colorless, and his eyes were colorless as well. He looked sick. He was bone skinny, and he was wearing dark overalls with no shoes. I was terrified. I've never been terrified before. I wanted to run, but I just couldn't. I couldn't even speak. I don't know how long we were standing there staring at each other. It seemed like forever. My heart was thumping in my ears and I was freezing. The air around me was so cold I could see my breath. He moved his hand so fast. If I could have moved, I would have jumped clear out of my skin. His skinny long finger was pointing up to the attic hatch. I felt like I wanted to move. I wanted to open the attic for him, but I just couldn't. I didn't even see him move, but now he was standing only a foot away from me and I heard three loud knocks again, but I couldn't tell where they were coming from. Somehow I gained the use of my legs then, and I bolted. I don't think I've ever run so fast, not ever. I grabbed my keys and my cell phone and got out of there. I don't know what happened. What is in my house? Is there something in my attic? Who was that man? I have no idea. I'm still reeling, and I haven't left my hotel other than to buy some clothes because I literally left my house with nothing except a set of chopsticks in my hand. I've been researching and trying to find help, but so far, nothing. My friends all think I've completely lost it. I even sent my camera footage to a few of them and they just say it's a glitch. You can see me standing there frozen and then the video is just static for four minutes and 27 seconds. I checked my two other cameras footage and neither of them captured anything from the time I tried to sit down to eat the first time until I ran in to get my keys and my phone. It's just nine minutes of static. I'm just really confused and terrified. I didn't even really want to reach out, but I felt so alone in this. Maybe knowing that someone has heard my story and has also been through something like this will help me. I know I have to figure it out. I only have four more days of leave time from my job left.